Uh, we are not very many today, but I think it won't be less exciting. So I would like to congratulate you on the days uh, day of the uh, on the day of space on cosmonautics, because our country sent the f launched the first man into space, and uh, it happened mostly due to the speed. Uh, the human communication is al also uh, defined by speed, and technologies have made information easily accessible by many people, and our communication is getting faster and faster. So, some information still remains uh, unused, unaccessible, and then it means that it loses sense for people, it loses its meaning. And very often, it does not depend on the quality of that information. It just remains somewhere hidden and we don't see it. Let's have a look why it happens. Well, first, of course, there are two reasons. Uh, this information must be ba uh, can be banned, a top a top secret, or it's not digitalized. Then this information uh, does not beca become the public knowledge, and mostly it's about young people who don't see any information further than two clicks away. So they are used to getting information very quickly. And if there is an information uh, kept in some library files or archaic files um, in subscriptions, then uh, it does not exist for them. So then we can make the conclusion that to make information more in demand, we need the technologies to distribute it and to make it more open. So you see the formula on the screen, in the screen. We, in 2012, we started our Cyber Leninka project and we uh, uh, we uh, created uh, the access or we made the access more technological and then we found out that the demand for knowledge is much higher. Our findings let uh, let us uh, let us mention this um, new type of uh, well methodology on all the levels from uh, students to authorities today. Cyber Leninka is uh, the largest open legal archive uh, in the world. And we are officially uh, acknowledged uh, by such organizations as UNESCO and Creative Commons, uh, which support the open licenses in the world. And just a few uh, figures about uh, Cyber Leninka. It's 22 million people who use our platform every year and read uh, articles and other publications. In 2017, more than 100 million publications were read in uh, Cyber Leninka. Uh, so now our archive contains uh, or just uh, uh, it's about thousands of uh, scientific publications, research public publications, and we are subscribed uh, subscribed to about 1,500 um, journals. <coughs> the answer is quite obvious. If we want to produce some new knowledge, we need to consume knowledge that has already been produced. And then, uh, so we have to make the turnover of knowledge uh, faster. So before you write, you read something. And uh, in this correlation, you need to read more 
you need to read 10 times more uh, before you uh, write your, uh, your own article. It gets even more important considering where our society is moving to. We have the uh, a numerous a numerous prerequisites um, to understand that uh, this sci science will uh, develop even faster. Uh, Davos in 2018, the Economic Forum in Davos in 2018, uh, and re the report on that. Uh, showed that um, about 12 million people lose their job beca jobs because of the digital economy. And in 12 years, those uh, people who are in employed in social sphere and in educational sphere will be more numerous because so far robbers cannot create um, and intellectually cannot create the knowledge uh, the same way uh, as human, humans do that. Because we um, invest creativity and emotions and all the other feelings which are typical for human communication in creating knowledge. But the, the history of evolutions and the history of revolutions I mentioned the uh, industrial revolution that we will very, very soon face. So just all these revolutions um, can witness uh, some new professions and some new occupations uh, simultaneously with dying out some old occupations. So the knowledge, uh, knowledge market will um, grow several times more. So uh, then five uh, trillion dollars, so that's, uh, uh, well, just how we evaluate uh, the digital part of the knowledge market. So the huge um, well number of people and huge amount of money will be involved in this digital mar market. And that's what our company is going to do in uh, the forthcoming five, seven years. And our goal is to make a digital platform. And that's what we are doing now. So, and that's the uh, digital platform which brings together the participants of the uh, production uh, process and the consumers of knowledge. And that's, uh, well, a window to uh, this knowledge world which will assist us in acquiring knowledge uh, in future. So then, uh, well, just In fact, uh, what are we going to have? We will reevaluate the whole system of um, obtaining knowledge. And due to this, uh, we are going to see two major changes. Uh, we have already mentioned some of them. First, uh, the transaction costs will go down. And many experts uh, speak about that because uh, there is high marginality and lo lots of losses. And the second aspect is uh, that we will manage the digital rights. Just then, uh, quite recently, we spoke about the management of digital rights, and we will very uh, soon see that everyone produces knowledge, and I call it individual capital. So when you create something, when you create knowledge, you increase your individual capital, which with the technological development can be capitalized, and it can be, uh, well, it can be converted into money, into income, in whatever. And so now we are witnessing very, a very special moment, and the future is coming. Thank you, Dmitry. I'm grateful for the presentation and for this optimistic outlook uh, into the future. And then I'm going to give the, the floor to Roman Serebrinikov. 
uh, and probably uh, so he is going to present some different point of view and then after that we will get back to Maxim Prokshin. Thank you. Thank you colleagues. I also would like to uh, congratulate you on the co on Cosmonetics Day. Actually we are uh, today we have the 55th anniversary of Tereshkova's flight, 30 years, uh, 30th anniversary of the Buran space shuttle, and uh, this is quite a unique space shuttle because it had only one flight. As for my topic, uh, it is about the role of public organization, information of criteria in information access. And if we speak about knowledge here, I would share my ideas as a representative of a NGO uniting journalists. Here, for the information to be turned into knowledge uh, and to structurize it and the resource where this information is stored uh, should be reliable. Uh, both on the uh, from the side of um, customers and those who downloaded there, so my uh, this is the resource, and uh, encyclopedias and libraries are uh, working uh, based on the same principles. So I have the following idea: the interests of public organizations is uh, in the interface where the information gets into these. Uh, massive and the uh, po point of getting this information out. I mean to say that all information should be available to everyone, but we understand that there is a need of some expertise what knowledge is. Uh, if there are some journalistic reports, uh, they are not fake. I spoke about cosmetics. My students made some uh, re research research and uh, they found some fake information but my students uh, believe that this information was true and used this information so if we speak about young people we have to have uh, clear criteria where this information should be uh, stored and be reliable information should be checked so on the access point i believe that uh, the role of certain ngos is uh, very important this be different unions or trade unions which would assess this information and make criteria of what information is knowledge and the second point probably not all the knowledge should be available for people of different ages and here we are talking about uh, the exit point at the exit point, any information collected in this da uh, database is not available to everyone. We carried out a, a research and we found out that people could not formulate their question. They could not uh, identify what they want to find. Uh, it used to be that people came to a library and asked the librarian what they wanted. It was quite clear. and But if a person did not know what he wanted to get, the librarian could help him and assist him very greatly because the librarian understood the library uh, funds. And this is a difference. Here we have a different story. Quite often it happens that a person cannot formulate the question and at the access point, uh, exit point the information is available for everyone and now uh, journalists quite often say that the system of education is very much lagging behind the uh, requirements of the industry. People are educated, they get very good education, but the indus but industries develop very fast. New technologies, new ideas, and uh, students are not trained or educated in this. And here we have the situation that the knowledge in the open catalog or a service a person can educate himself we know that the similar situation is in many industries the point is that the education obtained or received does not meet the requirements of the industry so now we have a new form of digital education and it's very clear on the example of studying languages for example or 
when people can use the system of uh, webinars or different programs, so the system of access to the existing knowledge, people get some knowledge and using the and using it can work but experience sh but practice shows that for working there need to be some verification of your skills and competences competences to get these competence ngos can make a, a list of requirements to certain knowledge and formulate the uh, list of knowledge which is necessary for a certain uh, activities and it's possible to get a certificate uh, confirming that a person knows or has certain competences for example if you work in mass media there should be certification that you can uh, take pictures that you can uh, make video etc in this, the, this is how banking sector is structured. When a person for a certain banking operation is certified, I believe that at the exit point we can have the same situation. On the one hand, information is structurized, verified, but on the exit point, if a person wants to get a certificate confirming its uh, his or her competences, he can apply to the same. NGO. So this is what I wanted to say. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, there should be some remarks made. I'm head of the NGO's Association of Internet uh, Publishers, and we are actually working within the paradigm which was outlined by Roman. We promote all the uh, diplomas or qualification works of stu students in best or major universities, and we suggest that all uh, employers and NGOs should have competitions for uh, students works and these organizations could motivate or provide some funds for the students and they should draw attention to more topical issues for the society and to manage thus the attention of public I believe there is some good idea and now we're speaking about the market of 5 trillion rubles. It's obvious that we need a lot of players on this market and NGOs will have their role on this market. And when we speak about IP chain, we are actually talking about an NGO, but we will touch upon that a bit later. Now I would like to give the floor to the moderator of pre previous session, Maxim Praksh who, as you know, represents the Skalkovo Foundation and who knows the normative regulation of digital economy. As far as I know, in the program of digital economy, there are some events within our agenda, today's agenda, about the open access to cultural heritage, cultural values. Could you tell us a bit about this? Uh, good afternoon once again, colleagues. Thank you for giving me another opportunity to uh, speak. Um, it's true, in the program, the digital economy implemented now, there are nine draft laws which are being um, elaborated. Uh, these draft laws are connected to um, the development of the Institute of uh, Intellectual Property. Some of the events envisaged by these draft laws are uh, large-scale events, uh, some are uh, more limited in their scale, and one of them uh, is on providing a better access, unhampered access to knowledge in science, uh, in uh, um, R&D. Uh, and when uh, this uh, uh, draft law um, was initiated, uh, many businesses uh, contacted us within the program of uh, digital economy, a uh, uh, large-scale program. And Skolkova uh, collected all the initiatives from businesses, listened to their opinion on the existing barriers that uh, prevent us from developing digital uh, economy further. And companies were very open, um, and uh, we 
collected all this information, processed it, and included the proposals in, into the draft law. And we forwarded this draft law uh, towards the relevant agencies. And now this draft law is being discussed in the federal parliament. And uh, uh, even though the existing uh, legislation is rather limited in its character, even though uh, we still have to uh, soften uh, the requirements in Article 12.5 of it, uh, we uh, probably should change the wording of this article, uh, saying that uh, uh, that. Uh, saying that uh, one can have unhampered access to this information only when being in the library. So uh, on the one hand, it's good th that we encourage people to come and work in libraries uh, because uh, libraries have always been the place uh, where uh, people get information. But on the, un on the other hand, uh, wherever you are, any place on earth, if there is internet, if there is Wi-Fi, uh, can be become a library. When we look back on the history of our development um, many years back, uh, decades back, we uh, all of us had to go to Himki um, department of uh, the Central Library and spend uh, days and days on first on traveling and then on uh, searching for information. Now it's just we are just a couple of clicks away from uh, um, any information that we uh, have to have for our R and D. We have specialized specialized um, databases for doing research and if you know the keywords of your uh, research work you can have access to uh, the right kind of research information so uh, the speed of obtaining information is um, unprecedented it cannot be compared to what we used to have in uh, during the era of video or the era of paper print and uh, of course this high speed uh, of uh, search what influences the uh, influences IP rights and uh, now uh, IP right holders have uh, uh, do, do they have uh, enough uh, leash uh, to, uh, enough space for maneuver to protect uh, to protect uh, their rights so how can uh, protection of their IP rights uh, be uh, ensured? Can uh, IP right holders uh, protect or limit uh, the use uh, of their intellectual products? When we speak about research and education, then probably we have to think about uh, allowing the use of allowing uh, users uh, to uh, refer to quotes uh, IP products if this IP intellectual property uh, products are uh, used for educational research purposes. If uh, at the same time, we have to think about the necessity to um, pay royalties to IP rights owners. We have to think about uh, striking a reasonable balance between IP right holders and uh, um, uh, the formation of new mentality of people and providing unhampered access to IP um, heritage. Uh, understanding recent um, technological trends, uh, we can uh, sort of uh, format our own mentality according to uh, the needs of uh, uh, reality. So I go back to Article 12.75 that I mentioned at the beginning of my um, uh, presentation. So what can be um, changed there? What amendments uh, do we have to introduce uh, into it? I, I have no solution uh, as to the wording of, of this article. And maybe it's, it's a good opportunity for me to ask you. So what do you think uh, the current uh, legislation uh, to what degree does it meet the requirements of, of our society, the requirements, the demands of our society for, for knowledge? 
what can be changed in in this uh, in the wording of this article so that we provide a much better access unhampered access to information of course it goes without saying we have to provide um, free access to to information in uh, especially if this information will be asked for r and d so uh, who would like to speak one or two people uh, can i ask somebody to give the microphone to those who would like to take part in our discussion So the question is addressed to me, as I understand here, yeah, so unexpectedly. Um, yeah, then I will uh, answer it. My opinion on that is uh, it's very difficult to uh, overestimate the Sci-Hub role because it has shown two major problems. The first problem is that uh, the first problem is the problematic or limited access to knowledge. Uh, so we have created SciHub and we started getting this knowledge in a, um, in a more simple way and now we feel how it can be. We understand how it can be. And the second thing which is no less important is uh, and it is given by SciHub. It's opened by SciHub as well. So that is uh, this progress cannot be stopped. Uh, the world is going to change, and the access to knowledge is getting faster and faster. And uh, so, uh, if uh, well, just you ask the question uh, whether Alexander uh, has to be here. Well, so she visits such. Uh, events in such places well oh, we haven't invited her but I'm not sure that she will uh, that she would have come yeah so I think that the question uh, contained uh, some certain answer um, so and if we cannot make it legal uh, if we cannot le make it legal um, uh, well just uh, this access, probably then th we will have to um, invite somebody from the uh, ministries and for somebody from the uh, government. So, yeah, I support the idea to make the access to the knowledge legal. Maxim is a better moderator than me, so and he gave the, flo uh, the uh, floor to people from uh, the audience. So, Alexander Sokovikova. Uh, t TV channel Russia and I address my question to all the colleagues who are here um, so we speak about free access and free uh, use so and we have got some norms which presuppose some um, free use of uh, IP and that's well quite a short list quite a closed list uh, with uh, lots of criteria and lots of demands and limits so do you think that our society is ready to uh, well just to use the objects of ip to this fair use of ip objects uh, so the same way that western countries use them Probably that was the question to the question or the answer to the previous question. I think it's a very good answer. Uh, so the uh, fair use doctrine is um, more flexible and it lets us use the I, uh, the intellectual product uh, more openly and free. Uh, it's um, American doctrine, and our uh, legislation system uh, probably is not very well ready for that. So I think that uh, it's not very problematic. And uh, when we tried to ban piracy, and and when we carried out different actions like. Uh, well, just like destroying uh, CDs, destroying uh, pirate disks. So, uh, but then uh, we understood how easy it is to get legal product, um, well, for a very reasonable price. 
And as we have already mentioned, um, if we uh, don't create some comfortable conditions for people, for those people who are very flexible nowadays, they will start looking for their opportunities in some of the jurisdictions. So I think that slowly but steadily, uh, we have to change the culture. We have to keep the culture of, um, well, respecting the copyright. We have to uh, think about improving this culture of free access. So probably we will have to make this open list of those uh, products which can be accessed uh, freely or accessed openly. So I guess that Skolkova Center of Comp Competences um, well, uh, thinks of this kind of compromise model or like open uh, list of um, products which can, maybe, uh, which can be made available for the public. Yeah, so we are uh, trying to aggregate uh, some demands and we are trying to aggregate the responses to such demands. So I cannot stay uh, away from that. So, but uh, I think that it works. Yeah, so you just don't create the demand. You ask the question and when you hear the answer, you understand that there is such a demand and there is such a necessity to change something in the system of um, knowledge availability. Yeah. So then, of course, we. Then Ludmila was asking for the word uh, for. Oh, just a very short commentary. Very short comment. Um, for good, uh, for fair and unfair use. Yeah, just a very short comment. You uh, yesterday at the plenary session we heard some figures which characterize the readiness of our society for some open use, open access, and I think it's not the uh, fight or just it's not the struggle with piracy, but it's the uh, struggle with the monetization of piracy. So if we think about some. Uh, well, just if we compare the money made on piracy and the money invested into, uh, well, just uh, uh, into the struggle of piracy, then we will get the ready-made answer, what we have to do. Yeah. So, Alexandra, that's uh, just a comment, but you are, uh, well, just you will have the time to speak with your presentation. I just wanted to answer the question uh, asked by the uh, journalist from Russia TV channel. Uh, when there is a concept of fair use, uh, so I, ca I cannot agree with Ma Maxim that we should have a kind of combination because this is some vague co uh, concept. We should take into account that in the United States, the Copyright Office annually gives recommendations on the ways of usage which are considered to be fair use. The second, second point, secondly, the ju judicial system of the United States uh, is more developed, in my opinion, and can uh, explain existing situations in terms of uh, fair use. I think that our legal system is not ready for that at the, for the time being. It should have certain orienteer, uh, certain orientation. Uh, there should be some criteria, uh, for example, the uh, aim of use and the volume of usage, etc. Thank you. This is quite an interesting dis discussion owing to Maxim. I can see that Maxim has now more and more work, so he needs to have more recommendations for his work. And the, probably they will establish a center for legal expertise and something like that. that. So businesses have a lot of uh, wishes of that. And now I would like to give the floor to Ludmila. I would ask to uh, show my presentation. My presentation is an answer to many of these questions, but on the, from the other angle. Now we are discussing which legislation should we use or apply and how to live with that. But anti-monopoly service has to imply certain legislation. We mentioned Yuri Gagarin today. You know that G Gagarin landed on in the Saratov region and his study, studies in Saratov, and 
this is an, exa an example which we have in our everyday activities. This is a different presentation. Please, can I have the presentation about Fulcrum. So, uh, where my presentation is being put. So, unexpectedly, we faced such a problem than when uh, crossing the board, customs borderline in Saratov, such a product as gel was imported. And the Saratov customs asked us, how can it be that the gel uh, crafts products are from China? And we were asked that it should be prohibited. And in this case, we uh, faced uh, some opposition who said that uh, import is not uh, selling. This is a legal usage of uh, the result of some activities. And we asked, how will you sell these objects? The answer was that there is a company, I'll show it now, uh, Nezabutka. But it's not uh, from Saratov. It is uh, sold uh, on the internet. So, and any one this this company is in, is, is in Moscow, and this uh, company can sell things uh, through the internet. So they not they do not violate any legislations. But uh, the ninth, the Article Nine of the law on protection of uh, competition, there was some legislation, uh, some violation of this. And the Saratov Customs initiated the law on Article 14.10, illegal usage of trademark. And uh, there was another question, why was it illegal usage of trademark? Because gel which we sold is made from plastic, but the gel which is actual gel is made of clay. So this article cannot be used in this concrete case. This is not a similar product. We had the same question. Is it the same trade market or different trade markets? And here we use the definition in uh, which is in the law, and it is said, it says that if a customer can substitute one, one, one product with the other, this is possible. The next question was, what is the guilt of the fault of the company who did that? So there was not any fault Be before importing this uh, products and producing these products we applied a, to a certain person and the person made a classical gel rose and it was not we who did that we had an agreement with the uh, author uh, so this that that was the situation the second situation is that uh, all these products are were produced in china by some company and there was an agreement in Chinese and English so there was no violation of the law the answer to this situation was quite clear if the order was from a person it means that all the prohibitions are for the actions of this person and we believe that it was violation of Article 14 of the law on protection of competition. Another question was the crossing of customs border. And if we speak about unity of economic space, and if we speak about Eurasian Union, We, we are in Kaliningrad, for example. We want to bring something uh, home from Kaliningrad. For, we want, do we want to bring amber made in China? Probably someone wants to do that, but the person, is, the, the person who buys amber uh, from any other region but not Kaliningrad, this is 
one situation. The second point is that uh, folk, crafts, folk crafts are always protected by the state. If gel was imported from China, not to Russia, but say was imported to, to Russia via Be Belarus or Kazakhstan, In this case, what authority should consider this application and what legislation is eligible in this case? And if we speak about, if we address to the Russian legislation, we can see that everything described in this situation is given to the civil, to the national civil code and should be considered by nation. by national authorities. Answering this question, we have to understand that there are certain difficulties and uh, we understand that business is ready now and wants to make money on this and we make a conclusion on our side that our uh, folk crafts as cultural objects, as values we are living. So uh, we have to uh, bear in mind the the, um, the necessity to keep up uh, cultural heritage, arts and crafts uh, heritage uh, of uh, our people, going back to our cultural roots. Uh, well, thank you very much for your interesting uh, presentation. So this is a, a very interesting point of view on uh, arts, uh, co commercialization of uh, arts, arts and crafts. and. Uh, uh, probably, uh, I, I, I was particularly impressed by one of your slides, Gzel from China, uh, uh, traditional Russian um, art and craft, Gzel coming from China. So this is a striking example. Uh, we, are, we have a different arts and crafts in Russia apart from Gzel, and, and of course some of them may still come from China. So I would like to um, ask my question to uh, Alexander, Alexander, uh, who represents two associates Alexander, who represents two associations uh, at the same time. Now we are uh, going to speak uh, about uh, the production of movies and uh, um, I uh, and piracy in movies, and that's why I would like to uh, ask you ab about uh, this problem. Alex, uh, well, uh, I was going to speak on another topic uh, about uh, public value. Uh, and uh, um, and uh, providing a wider access to uh, visual and cinema heritage of us of, of, of our country but since um, uh, nobody mentioned this topic maybe I will have to comment on uh, Maxim's uh, contribution to our discussion who in his contribution actually um, aired quite interesting ideas so what did he say he said that we have to think of uh, a change of uh, the wording of Article 1275 on limitations imposed on the use of um, uh, works of literature by libraries. Uh, I am going to explain for those who uh, do not are unaware of, of this uh, provision. So now uh, libraries are allowed to make digital copies of uh, literary texts but uh, users can have access to these dig digital copies only in libraries that will allow libraries to preserve their status. And uh, no matter um, when you come to a library, you are given either a digital copy or a print copy of a book. So libraries are for users and the main function of the library is to provide knowledge. And uh, the same holds true when we speak about visual knowledge, visual art. So um, when we when we producers of visual content, we are against uh, this idea because it will uh, be uh, an unhampered use, pirate use of uh, uh, copyright material, copyright content. Nobody will be interested in uh, purchasing a copy or, or a disc. So I like uh, some music groups. 
and I, 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 I and I like some films and some of uh, the game Game of Thrones um, uh, series. And if we uh, offer, for instance, uh, some episodes of the Game of Thrones um, for unhampered access, so how can we do that without violating uh, copyright legislation? Uh, if whoever comes to a library, even without um, uh, coming to a library, uh, uh, sitting in front of their computer screens, uh, sort of have an access to these episodes of uh, the Game of Thrones. Uh, one of the first presenters was the Cyberlink uh, director, and he spoke about uh, um, an idea of getting permits, permits for uploading um, visual content uh, into uh, our uh, uh, into their platform. Forms. And then users, when they um, uh, visit uh, the Kiberlinka uh, library um, website, uh, having this permit can have access to some copyright material. Uh, but then um, I, I go back to Maxim's contribution, uh, whether the copyright, the existing copyright legislation meet uh, the present day demands. My personal point of view is no. It does not meet the demands, um, the demand uh, of, of of reality. It does not protect copyright holders um, at all from piracy because there are ways and means of having access to copyright material without uh, any permits. But at the same uh, uh, at the same time, we have to um, strike a balance between unhampered access uh, for uh, to information for R and D purposes. And on the other hand, um, on the other hand, protecting uh, copyrights and uh, the copyright uh, holders and uh, protecting their right to get royalties, to get paid. Uh, when, if we, for instance, uh, take films, uh, most film, um, film company films, you can uh, watch all of them uh, on on YouTube. Uh, of course, uh, it, it's a bit uncomfortable, and uh, but there is no need to go to a library to uh, see this film, to get a permit in the library and see this film. You can do it at home, uh, and you can do it free of charge. Uh, but at the same time, if you watch a YouTube uh, version of this movie, you, you will have to cope with the, the uncomfort of constant advertising. Um, there are other ways how you uh, or, or whoever can uh, watch a film. You can borrow a, a disc, a CD uh, from a, a special uh, shop. But Yandex Music um, subscription is 129 uh, rubles. Uh, and this is another way of providing um, access to music files. And uh, subscription to a video library through Yandex is much more expensive. And not and very few uh, users can uh, afford such a luxury because it costs uh, more than 500 rubles a month. So we have to strike a balance between uh, the uh, interests of, of different parties, uh, um, right, um, IP, uh, owners and, and customers. So what do we understand uh, under uh, public good? So we have to create public good. We have to create cultural values and we have to provide access, wide access to the public good and public uh, um, values to each and every person. And for that, we have to uh, make investments into uh, the creation of cultural values. And uh, why uh, why do we speak? Uh, why, why do we speak about uh, a, a an insufficient and insufficient investment uh, into uh, this area? Uh, because it takes time to uh, find a niche and to invest into it. Let's take, for instance, movie business. So uh, lots of investment uh, um, are made into movie business, and uh, uh, huge profits are generated. But still, we understand that some some of the films produced in Russia or in Hollywood they never reach their customers, their viewers. Uh, because because uh, even though there were considerable investment into them, they will never um, get to the market because they will never pay off. They will not generate uh, enough profits. So we have to think uh, 
what, uh, where to invest and how much to invest. Uh, we have to um, uh, be aware of, of these risks. I would like to sum up. You wanted to argue with me, but you didn't give me any opportunity to, uh, for me to argue with you. You argued with Maxim mostly. In my view, we have got a concept like the human capital, and it's uh, nothing different from uh, knowledge. Yeah, so human capital is knowledge, cultural values, which we share if we think about the common, the public good. So, and we are interested in that uh, as a society. We live in the time of abundance uh, when we have got uh, much of everything. Uh, and but uh, as a film director, as a film producer, I share your point of view, of course. Yeah, so we don't, we cannot lose money on what we produce because then we fall into depression, and that doesn't help you very much. So, but we have to say that there are fifty shades of white. Yeah, so just we can open some things according to the law, then we can do it. So communists are ready to open all the communist, all the Soviet heritage. Um, well, and they speak about uh, it in, uh, well, just in the Duma. Yeah, so, and I think that's, well, well, probably it makes sense because that's the history and their, their history. Then if we take Skolkova as the center of competences, we understand that it's their responsibility to think about the competence development so that our country can d develop its n knowledge potential yeah, uh, well and then yeah so they they can provide for that that's why um, before I give the floor to Maxim and then then to give the floor to Oleg uh, to hear some reactions from them first I would like to add that uh, Different things which seem to be contradicting are the direct consequences of um, uh, of the fact that the topic is not very well defined. So we have got laws, we have got uh, some minor laws, uh, and we have got some re recommendations, and we have got practice. Uh, so and. Just, uh, I would like to mention some of legal things. First, we signed the agreement and we joined the IP chain. So, because, and I think that the contradictions between the producer and the right owner, uh, well, that's a temporary thing. And, uh, well, just uh, in the, all the instances, all the moments when the person uh, has got uh, their legal rights on uh, the produced or, or something that they have produced. So uh, they must be valued and of course they must be legally protected and uh, then uh, well, just they are kind of momentary, the same as uh, the human life. Yeah, and then they must be given to the public. So then we have to think about providing the open pub open access to uh, the same results of creation. So And we will have the whole cycle, you know, like the producer, the creator, the public, uh, the creator, the uh, uh, public, and the society. Um, so then I think that's very good. It's a very good step that we are, we are um, opening, gradually opening uh, rights uh, or opening access to the rights. Um, Maxim, the floor is yours. Um, Sasha, I would like to say that we are not going to kill anybody's business and we respect the uh, costs, all the costs, and finance, uh, both fina financial and uh, in terms of efforts that the uh, right holders uh, invest into creating a good product. And uh, I always support the idea that we need liberalization uh, when we get the knowledge. And we need to liberalize uh, the access to knowledge rather than access to entertainment, because entertainment must be paid. Mass product uh, must be paid. Uh, paid for. Of course, uh, research is also the thing that must be paid for. 
but I uh, then probably we think about some special pr publications and some certain movie products like um, well documentaries and some academic films but not about the mass product so uh, if you want to have um, access uh, and if you want to have uh, the chance to use everything free of charge then you won't have any motivation for the producers to create something new well um, if we think about some reforms of um, um, of our Mm, right, uh, IP protection uh, agencies. There is um, a version, or there is an idea that. Uh, so probably it will be possible to use the um, intellectual product, which is online, without paying for the usage of the intellectual product, but uh, paying the royalties to the uh, well to, to the producer, to the um, well just to the author. So, but of course, we have to differentiate between the educational and entertainment content. Then I add, and uh, the reason uh, so. Uh, the law does not define library. So if you have uh, a, sh a bookshelf in your house, you can treat yourself as library and you can participate in the uh, library exchange. The question is yours. Uh -huh. Maxim mentioned, has mentioned something that I wanted to discuss. So I support uh, the idea of differentiating between uh, the results of the creative work and academic creative work, because all the experts understand that the legislation uh, puts it together. We uh, see the differences and we see the differences and they must be put very clearly then as for the question uh, and Maxim has put it right so the fourth when the fourth part of the civil code was accepted by Duma it uh, stirred a uh, very active discussion uh, because there were different people supporting the idea of educational content, content and entertainment content, and there were the representatives of the uh, right holders. But we uh, finally stopped at the solution, which brought us to the present day system. So I think that we have to develop the access to knowledge. But uh, we also have to keep in mind that apart from the open access, there are some other ways of getting knowledge, and I wouldn't enumerate all of them here and now. Um, answering Maxim's question, I think it's obvious that uh, the current regulation, uh, well, current regulation corresponds to the current level of the, uh, well, just of our view on the problem. Because you cannot turn libraries, which are libraries, you cannot turn libraries into hubs on uncontro of uncontrolled uh, uh, of uncontrolled uncontrolled distribution of different uh, intellectual properties, like uh, well, different books, articles, entertainment, and educational content. Of course, uh, Skolkova Fund uh, well. Uh, just predicts what we will have in future and they are a little bit advanced uh, but I think that we have to still uh, be in the legal field the current legal field um, if you mention the if you mention American situation it is different and uh, following um, the question that we heard a little bit earlier uh, well, actually, I don't see any um, any well. Uh, I I don't see any advantages of a fair use system um, in before our uh, system. So I know that according to the American to American legislation, uh, a fair use is regulated by the uh, by some certain articles, and there are there is a set of criteria. 
which narrow down uh, the uh, well just the terms of use and one of them is the commercial use uh, another parameter is non-violating the uh, well, or just um, non uh, not no, non depreciating the uh, well just the, the product that you use and then American practice is so, so wide that it has worked out some certain approaches to and some certain solutions uh, in this field. And I think that our concept plan is uh, still being shaped. And there are lots of chances and lots of possibilities for our legislation to work on. So um, I would agree that our system is no worse. Uh, so though there are different opinions, and I'm not the, uh, the well, just the most um, the, the most active supporter of our system, but I wouldn't say that our system suffers very much if it doesn't have any fair use references. I think it's a very very balanced view on what we have. Yeah, so we have to think about the type of the product. So if it's the educational content, of course, um, you have to think about open access, but with some certain uh, certain limits. So and when it comes to the edu entertainment uh, content, then you have to ask for some special license to use uh, the product and to get access to it. Now I would like to give the floor to Oleg Nesterov, uh, saying that uh, Oleg Nesterov, who is the author of many inspiring initiatives, uh, probably you remember his project on non-screened uh, films of 1960s. And just he also is the author of the project of the anthology of Soviet music. Can you have a word? Can you say a word about these projects? And can you join our discussions? So, I have never thought that I would uh, do some inspiring enlightenment projects. It happened so that about 10 years ago, music uh, began coming to me, and I identified it as music from the 1960s movies. I didn't see these films, I didn't hear that music, but I heard this music in my head, music from unmade movies of the 1960s. I began to study this topic and I found unre unimplemented, unrealized uh, movies. Remember that we used to have some awards from the from Cannes and from Venice and uh, th that was in the 60s and we had about 50,000 uh, uh, we, we had a lot of studios those years which was very popular in Russia but in 1969 this um, evolution of movie was stopped and our movies, our film production did not become as it might have become. I met many people who wrote music and made films those years and uh, the music which was in my head, that was music from four movies, I met the people uh, who made these movies and I, I am as a I'm a musician, so I wanted to make this. Uh, I wanted to make music or soundtracks for these four unmade movies. I realized that this project had to be multi of multi-platform character. So I had. So we made a very big website where, besides these four unmade movies of the 60s. We also showed a lot of films 
or which were or, uh, a lot of material which was not implemented as as movies. In Germany, there was Bauhaus. Uh, in England, there was music. We gave uh, traveling into space and movies. Uh, so every country has its own valuable things. And I was surprised to find out that we did not have a portal for our precious, our valuable films. I made some mathematical mod uh, modeling. I carried out ba basing on the uh, Kino Science uh, Journal survey. I met and talked to many movie historians, Famine, Margot, and many others. So, and I worked with the IVI company and we agreed that each of these movies would get widgets without any commercial without any uh, so it was possible to watch all these movies without commercial and uh, one, 100 films not made i began working with my students on this topic and we uh, were working for about four we had been working for about four years and I started to put the information from our archives to free access, to open access, uh, m meeting minutes, uh, some other documents, and I had to pay for all these materials from my own budget. And actually, I was very happy about this, because if I had had some commercial sponsor, everything would have been okay. But when this multi-platform project appeared, site from uh, I would have been told that this is a special project of a certain brand here it was a different situation and for this site the life of planets in 2015 we got national award uh, and this portal became as the project in general is very uh, enlightenment or education project. This is an encyclopedia of audio movies and the information from archives was provided in a certain way and this project is aimed at 20 year audience. And it, the objective of this project is to study the experience of people well, those people who made movies in the 1960s and who uh, received different awards for that. And later I realized that all these projects is about the time when we managed to do everything. This is a very short Victorian epoch, which peak was on the uh, 30th of November 1962, uh, 12th of April 1962. It was, it's very interesting to study the epoch when we did a lot of great things. And this project is multi-platform because besides this internet portal we, are, we had music which emotionally brought the people to the movies which were not made and some unimplemented ideas uh, quite often tell much more about the epoch. So this is a kind of study of the epoch through the unimplemented ideas. Besides that, we made it online as a play, which we played at Goggle Center, at Merhold Stage and in the Alexander theater so uh, this was my first experience of working and I made this inspiring uh, project by chance for the young people and I brought them to the topic of Thor period movies uh, to the period of uh, Soviet movies now as for my present-day project. It's called Anthology of Soviet Music. It might be called uh, Anthology of Anti-Soviet Music because uh, film music in the Soviet Union was the most 
free manifestation of all the arts. In movies, a composer could work freely, could use movies as a ground for, as a uh, artistic laboratory, and we actually saw that. For example, Schnitke did so, and this project is designed as multi-platform project, and together with educational project Arzamas, we uh, we work together. In 2014, when we made the Life of Planets project, the project Edge on Mars did not exist. Exist. We make a special course. Will be, course will be in the uh, special project where we have 20 of the most important composers of the Soviet period. Will be. And the core of this will be a musical uh, compilation or composition. A young person, having heard this uh, collection, will want to watch the movies with this music, to read about this person, to li uh, listen to his music, and to get some knowledge about the person. The music itself is is not generally represented as music. And I have such an idea to separate music from the shot and to add this music to eternity. We all know that music is the soul of a movie. Sometimes we do, not know, we do not remember the plot of the movie, but we remember the music from the movie. And I... I'm going to uh, digitalize this music to uh, separate it from uh, uh, the visual uh, track to create a separate music track and uh, uh, I'm going to upload it in a g digital form uh, onto uh, legal uh, digital platforms uh, for a wide uh, for a wide audience uh, to use it so I would like to introduce this uh, music heritage of unseen films uh, to bring this music closer to uh, to the users, so I'm I'm going to produce some podcasts, and uh, Radio Arzamas uh, is one of the radio stations uh, run and managed by young aspiring uh, specialists, and during a very uh, short period of time, they have uh, many subscribers, and they also uh, share my my position, and um, I'm going to work with them with this radio station and second uh, um uh, uh, we're going to uh, work uh, with the Yandex music uh, Apple music and uh, iTunes and um, uh, all these platforms uh, will become our partners and we're going to use them for distributing knowledge on uh, music and of course we're going to organize a number of uh, of offline events and we have already um, uh, negotiated with the Tretiakov Gallery uh, on the organizing uh, a Thor uh, period of um, Russian history uh, exhibition in 2019. It will be one of the biggest uh, events. Um, we uh, This event uh, will um, include this event uh, will uh, include uh, music performances uh, and theatrical performances as, as well there will be some uh, personifications even when the musicians uh, will um, um, act as if they were composers famous composers for instance Schnitke and many others so uh, it will be a retrospect um, a, a retrospect uh, uh, performances uh, they have uh, the tragic of gallery has uh, good stages and even cinema halls uh, for um, 
all these elements of this large scale event. But in order to organize this event in 2019, I have to purchase uh, some some of the unseen films from the state. I have to purchase these films from Mos Film Film Studio. I have to invest uh, into um, uh, this purchasing. That means that I'm buying this information from the state. And uh, having bought it, I'm going to offer it back to the state since I'm going to show this priceless pieces uh, to young viewers. And young viewers are the future of the country. And this is one uh, of my priorities, uh, one of my priorities today. And of course, I understand how difficult uh, it is uh, because uh, I will also have to invest into the digitalization of all these films. And um, uh, my third point of view, of course, is uh, how to provide a wider access um, to all these treasures. And that's why I'm here. So if you allow me to intervene, uh, I, I think what you're doing uh, is uh, the right way to address this um, um, task, to bring knowledge closer to its audience. Cultural memory is uh, is um, important. Yes, you are right, because we are going to, uh, it's an educational project, um, largely. Uh, but on the other hand, it's, mu it's a music project uh, which is being implemented in a legally justified form form because we um, we um, meet all the requirements of, of the copyright legislation and um, all the download uh, and even though it is a commercial project we uh, stick to the existing legislation and meet uh, all the requirements so when I said that we are going to um, include online and offline events into uh, our our um, program. So I forgot to mention that we are going to uh, uh, organize uh, some events, uh, retrospective events on uh, vinyl um, music. And uh, excuse my interrupting, but uh, I, I, I agree with what Maxim said. Uh, it's important to uh, attract sponsors because I understand that this is an expensive project. Of course, it, ideologically, um, uh, the, your project is very close to what Skolf Skolkova has been doing, uh, but Skolkova cannot invest into your project and your project is an expensive one. And um, if the state cannot invest uh, the, the uh, enough money uh, to cover all your expenses. I'm sure that we can look around and find maybe private investors or other investors who are ready to sponsor you. Because keeping up this priceless, priceless pieces of, of our uh, culture uh, is uh, our common common task. Uh, well, uh, there are other ways and means how to solve this problem. We have to make uh, better use of uh, the available technological solutions. Uh, that's my point of view. Uh, for instance, um, when it comes down to funding, why don't we use resort to crowdfunding as an instrument? Have you thought? Uh, have you thought of it? Yes, uh, we uh, thought of crowdfunding. Uh, we are aware of this instrument, but uh, uh, you understand this this scope of this project. Uh, this is like the gold of Troy. Uh, it's a large-scale project uh, that uh, will have to have a, a tremendous impact, a huge impact on our viewers, our viewers. And uh, if we manage to impress our viewers at the initial stage of our project, maybe we will, it will be able to attract more investors into it. And uh, I am very much involved in social projects, and I understand that if you don't start investing into a social project, if you don't set an example, it's difficult to uh, attract uh, uh, other investors as well. And uh, if it comes to me, uh, I can promise that my, my company, my agency will definitely invest into your project. So we started with the open access to the knowledge, and I think that uh, finalize, we will finalize the same uh, with the same issue. I represent two um, uh, two institutions here, uh, one of which is the National Electronic uh, Concept Library, and it unites many libraries in Russia and several universities, and we provide informational support to the science, to the research. 
there is a big problem, which is the legal culture in the universities which produce knowledge. And very often, uh, you can find the open platform, like uh, open uh, depository of knowledge, but there is a big uh, there is a big difference between free access and open access because if you can somewhere you can come somewhere and read uh, some and read some some publication or some information uh, you don't know um, where uh, you can get it so you can come and read but you don't know who to ask to get the open access so according to the berlin declaration uh, it's better if uh, the um, if the work in the academic field uh, can be distributed openly and in the most open access and that's the issue of attribution and um, I wouldn't say that in Russia it is so yeah so I would say that if uh, the content is financed by taxpayers then the same taxpayer must have the open access uh, and free uh, open access to uh, some product. So the open access depends on the license, and uh, then uh, then Creative Commons, the company Creative Commons, and the strategy Creative Commons support the idea of um, getting access to uh, the um, creative products. So attribution has become the legal standard, and about 30% of all the academic publications um, are licensed with it. Uh, at the same time, the civil code also presupposes uh, some open licenses, so which means that we have got the legal background for <coughs> getting the open access to uh, the publications. So, but uh, some sites of academic institutions and si sites of uh, libraries are still afraid of uh, giving the open access to their content because probably they are not very well aware of the legal background for, for uh, doing so. Then uh, another uh, institution which can be which also can be regulated by the same legislation is the National uh, Archive. Yeah, um, so and uh, I think that it will uh, certainly simplify the work for many uh, academic authors, academic writers who can publish their work, uh, referring to some certain uh, certain license to uh, for doing so. So I think that the whole pro uh, process of academic research and the discussion of the academic research must uh, also become open, and we uh, refer to European standards, uh, for example. Horizon 2020, so which will uh, which decide uh, which has dis uh, have decided to publish all the uh, research uh, data and research findings in open source up to 2020. So you see uh, that uh, well the academic uh, research opens the access not only to the publications but to uh, research data and to the research process so that you. Can can witness everything and you can see everything. Uh, the uh, licensing process is also getting more and more open and it means that science has become more transparent for the society at large so that people can uh, show their demand and they can check uh, somehow uh, what kind of activities ha have been carried, what uh, has been carried out on the money that the taxpayers pay. I would like to uh, speak about a project which is called Open Repository Com. Uh, well, it's uh, uh, it's relatively relatively new. So we have been working on this project since December 2017. Um, and we s unite several universities uh, and three repositories. The major partners are Tomsk State University, then Kazan Federal Universities, and S Sibir uh, Siberian Federal University. There are some other universities who are thinking about joining the, pro uh, the project. Uh, St. Petersburg uh, University is also looking um, for some uh, opportunities to uh, join the project.
So we have got several platforms uh, from leading universities who are ready to work with the content and understand how they are uh, represented in online in different networks. It's not the, um, the most common practice, uh, which means that you have to talk to the universities how to work with this content, how to license it so that you can make it more efficient and uh, uh, bring uh, this carrot knowledge uh, from the network from the net uh, together into one place so that's why we have created this platform and we developed the standards of online work the um, uh, culture of work with electronic documents and that's a good opportunity to tell everyone which practices you can find abroad and how you can make it more efficient here Another project uh, is called uh, Scientific Correspondent. We uh, are going to publish the uh, final research uh, works of the students of the other universities so that it, it can be possible to see what kind of product the universities uh, produce and at the same time uh, so that people could have the idea of what is the final product that the students prove their competences with. So, uh, uh, so we uh, we remember the address from the, our government, uh, which uh, was aimed at universities to publish all the research papers of all the levels. But I know that it was uh, actually only about the uh, PhD uh, papers and some university professors' publications, uh, so which were downloaded, uh, uploaded online. Um, so before this project, we also um, launched a pilot project in uh, Moscow State University's, uh, University. Uh, students of uh, one department and the Faculty of Journalistics, uh, Journalism uh, published their work works and this project showed that as soon as the work is published online so the requirements to its standards uh, and its level uh, is uh, are getting higher so that improves the general uh, requirements to the uh, level of the work now we have got only two universities with the electronic library system of open access uh, and we are really looking forward to enlarging the network. And these are the universities who signed the agreements with us, and they are going to publish their final works at the end of the academic year. We have got four federal universities, as uh, St. Petersburg University and the Academy of National Economy and some other one, uh, some other universities. You know that how difficult it is to make a f the first step and especially when it when it's about some open access. And we are happy to see St. Petersburg University as one of our leaders because uh, it's very good to have such a reputable university as the, well, just as the leader. So it can pave the way for the other ones, uh, especially when uh, the, the issue deals with the open access to the uh, students' final papers, because it very well shows what's going on in the university and what the level of the graduation papers is. Uh, so. I think that uh, the um, uh, universities who work with us and who send the packages of works, uh, well, we think that uh, we can uh, speak about the non-commercial license. Yeah, so because it, uh, these are the works which cannot be used commercially, but at the same time there will be some other opportunities, some additional opportunities for these universities because some of publishing houses, academic publishing houses, are really into uh, finding some new authors and uh, researchers who are ready to publish their works. and. Uh, 
well, it's a very convenient uh, resource for the students uh, who were not thinking about publishing their works uh, for financial purposes uh, or for um, for financial reasons. But then they can even get some royalties if their work get pub gets published in some monography or in some collection of papers. By the next year, we uh, want to attract some employers uh, so that employers would set their own um, requirements uh, for uh, the papers that they would like to get published and they would like some uh, certain fields of knowledge and fields of study to, de to be developed. So then it can be I introduced uh, within the framework uh, of a project uh, which can bring together the university and employer. Uh, well, just we uh, haven't thought about it yet in full detail. So I think that we will be able to do something um, well promising in this uh, respect. Um, and uh, so uh, St. Petersburg University is a very good uh, flagship uh, in this um, type of work. Then we have another project which is about the Bank of Knowledge, the Federal Bank of Knowledge, so to say. And we signed the agreement to join this project with IP Chain. Mm -hmm. I will continue. I am very proud of this project. We were very lucky that we found efforts and uh, funds for this project and we focused on this. Uh, the InnoSphere pl platform is a very important element of public structures of the information epoch. This is a platform, platform which is made around the uh, ledger, open and uh, free. We fix information in all the legal uh, works of art which are in open uh, access. Uh, this, these are works which are published um, with the indication of its status and you can see that the technology itself which we are developing is called the Federal Reserve System of the Bank of Knowledge. It unites the projects uh, which provide access to information. This title probably does is not liked by many people because it has some associations with the Federal Reserve of the United States, but still we believe that uh, not knowledge nowadays is a major capital and I believe that we managed to we could open the recipe to how to preserve this capital for it to work for everyone because it is open and I believe it is very important that we manage to sign an agreement with IP Chain because I believe that combination of these two absolutely different systems, one of which uh, earns to the open, uh, to open the access, the other which pr protects uh, the rights of uh, copyright owners or holders. We will not, of course, provide access to all the works. And we also believe that the blockchain technology, which uh, enable us to avoid the situation when people take money for uh, some works of art. So I hope that that we will work together and will uh, enable us to regulate our information system when people will be in one of the categories. Either they publish to be heard, to be read, or those who are interested in commercial effect of their activities. And I believe this is the, right, the correct approach. We hope that everything is published will never be lost. Because the technology which we have made uh, pr makes it possible to uh, reliably uh, preserve the works of art. And you can see that there are only three functions. This is identification and standardized description of works of art. Uh, every work of art has its identification number. Uh, this identificator is called RAI, which is which is heaven in Russian. Uh, and everyone can get access to your work. Everybody knows you and. This is the same te te technology. Uh, this is a Russian technology. Then, 
replication, the work which gets into the system, the, um, the reserve copies of them are made in case something happens to the work of art, so it to be easily restored. And the next year we hope to introduce a new function, this is veris ver verification. If you make some mistakes, uh, you can, the author can substitute the version with the new one. It enables to, uh, to preserve backup versions in case something happens. Uh, Wikiteka started this project with us, with us together. Uh, this is a hub of open uh, data, Infocultura, uh, Alpub, and Public Library. These are our partners who we cooperate with, National Reserve Bank. Also, this is a depository of different works. Probably will, uh, probably Saint Petersburg University will also support us. So we want guarantee eternity for all our partners, and I believe it's worth doing that because, as I said, the contradiction between society and copyright holders can be avoided. It is possible to manage the uh, legal status of the work of art in this platform. You can use different options. Uh, if you have any some problems, nowadays we don't have many problems. The main problem is... So, the guild of producers in, uh, influenced on the formation of legislation and that was a positive moment but as for the texts you know that this is a very chaotic system different works are stolen they're published on in the data bank and this problems we should protect the rights of this author of uh, these authors and we will do that with our partner structures and other organizations which will speci specialize in this the most important thing for us is that using this ledger we will have a complete and clear picture of what is public heritage what we can preserve uh, safely and it would be accessible for us free of charge. You know that Inusfera that was Vernatsky's project. We believe that this is a good Russian idea with a global potential and some countries, India, China, BRICS countries also participate here. If we speak about Ledger you can see that everything is available. You have information about the authors with the dates of their life, so you can see when some copyright expire. You so you can check if some work of art is publicly accessible. We also believe that the uh, Copyright lasts eternally because this is a moral right. People who create some works of art want these works of art to be used. But in the moment when the property rights are expired, there should be uh, there should these works of art should be in open access. We hope we will organize. We will make cooperation with our copyright communities. I believe that they are interested in working with us and cooperating with us. Here is the calculator of legal status, some other services in this system, and I'm happy to say that nowadays we have, today we have such a historical moment when we signed the agreement and we will uh, maintain IP chain. And I hope that in the process of this work we will clarify many details. If you have any ideas or suggestions, I ask you to speak, to share them. These are our contacts, our, address, our emails. If someone wants to say a few words, please take 
Your time. Yes, I can see there someone wants to have a rambling. Do you have a mic? Good afternoon. My name is Dmitry Kazimekin, uh, doctor of technical, um, uh, doctor of uh, technical sciences, Kazansk uh, University. So this is a comment uh, and uh, a question. So uh, it's about unauthored, unauthored uh, creative works. So how is this problem solved in other countries or other regions? How about uh, deposits uh, that are created in case uh, authors of these unauthored works um, appear or are identified? And the second question is about the readiness of our legislation to meet the demands of uh, the challenges uh, of uh, technological revolution. So when we were speaking about uh, the visual content and educational content, nobody spoke about another problem, uh, fan fan uh, creative works or fan clubs creative works when on the basis of entertainment content new creative works are um, come into being and who uh, owns uh, the IP rights who is uh, copyright owners of such creative works um, I see a discrepancy between uh, reality and uh, provisions of the legislation. Well, if you let me, I will give a brief answer to your questions. And whoever wants to um, comment, you're welcome. So, of, of course, uh, fan clubs, uh, 50, 50 Shades of Grey was just a... Um, uh, was uh, changed by fan clubs and then it became a commercial object and uh, the copyright owners are those who create uh, systems of uh, who, who those who create a system of commercializing uh, fan club uh, creative works so of course it's a gray zone of legislation and gray zone of um, our business so we understand the challenge uh, when it comes down to unauthored uh, creative works. We discussed uh, this challenge during our the first session. Today, there was a question from, from the audience about it, and I think that Andrei Krychevsky uh, reminded or, or quoted uh, uh, Mr. Simonov for, for his concept of risk management. Of course, there is a ready-made solution, um, uh, uh, ready-made solution as far as I uh, understood, uh, the Ombudsman on uh, intellectual property rights uh, to create a deposit uh, at a notary, at one of the notary offices, and then if uh, the unauthored, uh, if the author of the previously unauthored creative work is identified, uh, the author can get his royalties and payment. And the Ombudsman made his uh, presentation on, on this particular problem during one of the Eurasian um, IP rights events. Uh, it was quite convincing. But of course, there are um, certain points that have to be further discussed when it comes down to deposits, and, and, and uh, especially when it comes down to royalties. And, uh, of course, uh, I see that there are niches in legislation, there are gaps that have to be filled in. Uh, when it comes down to creative works uh, written or created during the 20th century, from 40 to 90 percent of, of these creative works uh, do not have um, uh, their registered um, copyright owners. Um, especially if they were created by teams of, of authors. And generally speaking, the problem of unauthorized creative works is um, is uh, a major uh, is a cause of a major concern at the moment. Uh, in this um, uh, respect, IP chain platforms will may become a solution because uh, if, even if we have teams of authors or, or a collective of authors, collective author, uh, then we'll be able to track um, uh, the uh, ownership. Um, of this or that creative work. Uh, so any any other comments or I do think I concluded, uh, I summed up. Uh, well, I have a comment and a question at the same time as the previous speaker. So I understand that uh, I uh, was invited to participate. Uh, uh, I was invited to participate in another um, session. I should have been uh, one of your participants. Uh, so I would like to ask my question, uh, ask Natalia. 
a question. So judging from your experience uh, of cooperating with higher education institutions, uh, have you had any um, cases when students forwarded uh, their claims? Uh, well, uh, I had several cases um, uh, from St. Petersburg uh, University uh, because uh, they asked us to um, to uh, withdraw uh, their works from public access from our platforms. And there was such a case, I said, but um, as, as I said, but every time we upload uh, their works or prepare them for publication, uh, we ask students for their permission to publish or to upload uh, the results of, of uh, their research works. Otherwise, we have never had any conflicts. We work with students. We explain, we explain uh, the benefits of uh, publications and we explain their um, uh, copyrights, uh, uh, their copyrights. There are other cases, for instance, uh, for instance, uh, for instance, some students write to me and uh, and complain about other websites uh, uh, um, upload upload their work. So the students contact me and ask me to assist in deleting their works from other websites. So we do not deprive students of their uh, copyrights, uh, their moral rights for their research works. Uh, on the other hand, we try to assist them to spread uh, knowledge, to spread uh, their research works. We, uh, uh, and the cases that you uh, referred to, this is, of course, an unpardonable behavior on the part of those we websites who have uh, students' research works. But I don't remember a single uh, court case when students took this matter to court. I, I, I cannot remember such a practice. Um, well, yeah. So I represent the company which uh, p deals with such problems. Well, actually, the uh, problem of um, unauthored uh, works, uh, for example, the film uh, to which uh, the music was written by Schnitke. Uh, so these works used to belong to Goss Tele Radio Foundation Fund. I think so it's better to address these, these issues to us. That's to us directly, that's the uh, Russia tele t TV channel because we have got the database. It's because when we applied to that channel, they said that it was not their responsibility. So then just we couldn't find the answer to that uh, question, to that issue, and so that's difficult. So I would ask you as the representative of um, uh, TV channel Russia uh, to join the same work and uh, help uh, well, or assist finding these unauthored works well yeah probably I I think it's it's a good initiative and uh, that would that could be interesting to the that could be interesting to the um, uh, to the channel uh, well just support the, uh, their movement I would uh, this beauty is um, disappearing, so the authors die and the archives die. They disappear. They disappear. These works disappear. They stop existing physically in a physical form. So some time will pass, and we will have no, we will have no chance to recover them, to rediscover them, because physically they won't exist. Just after a short time, we will lose many things, and we will have to catch the moment, catch the time. Uh, I have a short comment. Like if you know that it's uh, Schnitke's uh, music, so then it's not an orphan work. 
So you speak about the uh, difficulties in acquiring the copyright. Yes, well, I uh, well I have solved this issue this week. So I brought the money and we signed the um, the contract, but the related rights are still there. So we don't know where they are. We, we don't know where to find the related rights. So, but when the recording was done, I think that there was no issue of related rights, and that's quite an arguable issue. Um, I would have, I would say a few words about the orphan works uh, in general. To, in, to my mind, uh, this problem does not exist. I think we exaggerate it. I uh, don't agree with Ivan, uh, uh, with his assessment that there are hundreds of thousands of orphan works. Well, I, I don't agree with that because even when uh, the uh, idea did not exist uh, in the times, in the former times, we somehow managed to uh, settle down all the issues with the copyright and with uh, royalties and everything. So the only thing that you uh, need is your desire, desire to find, uh, well, just uh, to find the right owner, the right holder. Then you have to understand historically where these orphan works come from and uh, he, the joint efforts of different commissions uh, in Euro commissions uh, who support the idea of limiting the copyrights and uh, limiting different rights. So uh, facilitated the uh, movement for um, well, just for limiting the access to different rights. I don't think that we will have to carry out the same work in the Russian legislation. Probably we will, we will have to think about some, uh, some changes in terms of um, Often works, uh, but I have to. Uh, I, I think that we have to think about some uh, rational attitudes to uh, the often works. Uh, well, yeah, probably we have to find some resources, financial resources. We have to mobilize, mobilize different funds to get some money to buy these rights. Um, well, then communists think that uh, at the same time we have to distribute some uh, means, uh, some um, funds to the well probable authors. Um, uh, so we have different uh, things, like different epoch, epochs. For example, the movies of 2000s, uh, when uh, movies were screened, but they were never f uh, were filmed, but they were never screened. Uh, so, but we have to think about the preservation of our cultural heritage. It means that we will ha we will preserve our memory, and humanity should have memory, and we should um, well just allocate our memory uh, into the right place, and we should uh, take hold of our memory. And we need uh, to spend some resources um, not to hurt the uh, authors and uh, the right holders. And I would like to spend my minute, my last uh, well, minute uh, to exercise my right to give you some food. You know that lunch break started half an hour ago, but I think that we uh, abused a little our time a little bit, and I uh, well invite you to have lunch.